You're listening to the N2K Space Network. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. No, you've not tuned into a Hollywood podcast. Money talks, and it's certainly needed in the space industry. It was Jerry Maguire that made the show me the money line infamous in all industries, and I'm sure it was ringing in the ears of the venture capitalists and tech firm bosses as they signed an open letter to the US Defense Secretary requesting that DOD innovation acquisitions get reformed and more money gets passed around. T-minus. Today's June 26, 2023. I'm Alice Carruth, and this is T Minus. VCs and tech firms beg the DOD to reform procurement procedures. Ariane 5 final launch date is set. Virgin Galactic announces its first commercial flight on June 29th. We speak to Emily Dwinnells, director of the Main Spaceport Initiative, on the latest developments at the Main Space Complex. And I'll bring you the latest from last week's Spaceport America Cup. On to today's Intel briefing. 13 executives are behind a letter asking US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin to change how the military procures cutting-edge technology, including space, by the Defense Innovation Unit. If you've ever used the Federal Procurement Interface, then you can understand their frustrations, but they're going beyond complaining about the clunky web RFPs and are looking for more grant funds, less rigid cost accounting rules, and of course, more money for annual procurements. The letter states that antiquated methods for developing requirements and selecting technologies have drastically limited the Department of Defense's access to the best commercial innovation, and this must change. We will see if SAM.gov, which stands for System for Award Management, gets the facelift that it needs and if this letter gets the DoD to show those big tech firms more green notes. We've been talking about this for a few weeks now, and it seems that the final Ariane 5 launch will take place on July 4th. ESA's go-to rocket for ride shares and cargo missions has experienced some delays to its final voyage due to a problem with the pyrotechnic systems. This last flight of the Ariane 5 will be the 117th mission for the vehicle since it was introduced in 1996, and will be replaced by Ariane Space's new Ariane 6 rocket. And of course, it's not breaking news when we talk about delays in space. Our friends at Space News are reporting that the maiden flight of the United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centur rocket has been further stalled due to necessary reinforcements to the Centur's upper stage. Following the completed investigation of a hydrogen leak that occurred during a March test, the Centur stage will be sent back from Cape Canaveral to ULA's Alabama factory for modifications. The timeline for modifications, further testing and rescheduling of the inaugural launch remains undisclosed. 
The eventual Cert 1 mission will carry Astrobiotics Peregrine Lunar Lander, Amazon's Project Kuiper prototype satellites, and a Celestis payload. Virgin Galactic has announced that they're targeting this Thursday, June 29th, for their first commercial space flight. The passengers are from the Italian Air Force and National Research Council, plus one Virgin Galactic astronaut trainer. The crew are expected to conduct scientific research experiments during the suborbital mission at Spaceport America in New Mexico. The commercial spaceline company says that it has transformed the cabin of their VSS Unity spaceplane into a science lab to allow the passengers to interact with payloads during their time in microgravity. Godspeed to the pilots and the four-person crew. And speaking of four-person crews, the first of three planned Crew Health and Performance Exploration Analog Missions, or CHPEA, has started. On Sunday, the crew entered their home for the next 12 months, a 17,000-square-foot 3D-printed habitat located at NASA's Johnson Space Center, known as Mars Dune Alpha. There, the crew will simulate a Mars mission to help assess health and performance in relation to Mars resource limitations in isolation and confinement. The door is officially closed, meaning that the next time the crew will experience the Earth's sky will be in 12 months. California-based defense technologies company Andrew Industries has acquired solid rocket motor manufacturer Adranos for an undisclosed amount. It is hoped that the acquisition will update Adranos's solid rocket production complex in Mississippi into a modern manufacturing facility, which will increase output of both standard and Alatec solid rocket motors to thousands per year at a much faster lead time than currently available. Through this acquisition, Anduril will become a merchant supplier of solid rocket motors to prime contractors delivering missiles, hypersonics and other propulsion systems for the US DoD. Calling all sat-nav companies in Europe, ESA has launched an invitation to tender, calling on companies to join a mini-constellation demonstration of at least 10 satellites placed in low-Earth orbit for positioning, navigation and timing services. The new system is a possible enhancement for ESA's Galileo constellation, which resides in medium-Earth orbit and is approaching its limit on technical performance. The demonstration request includes space and ground segments, system engineering aspects, operations, launch, the test user segment, experimentation and service demonstration in representative user environments. And later this week, the European Union Agency for the Space Programme will host Galileo High Accuracy Service Days, known as HASS, for users, industry stakeholders, application developers and international experts to learn more about HASS. This event provides an opportunity for all attendees to discuss and share expectations of Galileo Haas, its challenges and benefits. Participants will learn more about the status of Galileo Haas, including current performance, evolution plans and key user applications. There will also be dedicated user sessions, including live demonstrations, allowing participants to experiment the Galileo Haas capabilities. That concludes today's briefing, but we've included a few extra stories for you in the selected reading section of our show notes. The first focuses on the US Department of Defense investment in plasma-assisted hypersonic propulsion. The second is an interesting biomedical piece from NPR about why humans are more susceptible to infections in space. And the third is an extraordinary engineering and water management achievement from the International Space Station. Check out these and the rest of today's stories in the selected reading section on our show notes. Hey T-Minus crew, every Monday we produce a written intelligence roundup. It's called Signals and Space. If you happen to miss any T-Minus episodes, this strategic intelligence product will get you up to speed in the fastest way possible. It's all signals, no noise. You can sign up for Signals and Space in our show notes or at space.n2k.com. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. 
Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. Our interview today is with Emily Dwinnells, director of the Maine Spaceport Initiative. I started off asking Emily what the Maine Space Complex is. So the Maine Space Complex is this moonshot that came to bear a couple of years ago. We're looking at the, the Maine Space Grant Consortium, which is a NASA-funded 501c3 um, that exists in every state. I was really thinking about the investments they had been making in the state and realizing that they'd been doing some really high-level, really important research, but they hadn't necessarily been getting an ROI on the research. The people who were doing it weren't sticking around. There was no space industry in the state. And so it started Dr. Terry Shahada kind of thinking about how could we change this? And so he got together a handful of 17 people from the space industry within Maine and they just spitballed ideas. And what they came up with was this concept of a main space complex. It had, you know, several other names before that, but that's sort of the latest iteration. And what the complex is really meant to do is to take advantage of Maine's natural geographic location, which is actually a competitive advantage for launch because it hangs out over the eastern seaboard and um, is an excellent place to launch into polar orbit. So identifying this as a sort of strategic advantage, they decided to move the the sort of inquiry forward, which is when I came on board and started developing the main space complex. So the main space complex, to answer your question, is a three-legged stool, uh, and it's focused on launch services, so the establishment of a spaceport in Maine. The second piece is data and analytics, so it's a taking whatever's downlinking from space, from the satellites, and um, making a service or productizing that data. And then the third piece is an innovation hub. So it would be focused on R&D to spin up more in-state space industry. So can you tell me a little bit about the history of how this started, where you're at at the moment, and what the next steps are for the program? Uh, We really kicked this off in 2017. Um, is when the idea started percolating. And then I got involved in 2019, which was the initial feasibility study. So if we build it, will they come? And that was really reaching out to in industry and saying, you know, what are you experiencing in launch? Is there a backlog? Is there a need? Do we have demand? What does this look like? And where is the industry going? And so we had, we sort of worked through the stage gate process um, that was conclusive. There was demand. So we progressed to the next stage, which was the um, business implementation planning, where we sort of formulated and fleshed out all of the business units, the organizational structure, the operating model for the spaceport, and then moved on to the strategic planning piece where we got our, you know, short, mid and near, uh, far term objectives outlined. And from there, Today, what we're doing is looking sort of into the future of space. What is the future of space going to look like? And how do we develop a workforce that will be equipped to enter and contribute out of the gates? So in the current moment with regard to the space complex, we have just passed legislation in the state of Maine to create a private public partnership called the Maine Space Corporation. And so the corporation is actually just being instantiated. They were sworn in this past week, and they will be taking over at the helm to drive forward the strategic plan. Nice. That's what really led into my next question. Who's funding the idea behind having a space complex in Maine? So the funding that we've received so far just to do the initial studies has come from two different bodies. So the first one is the Department of Commerce. And they have contributed some to the last two phases. Uh, We also have an in-state sort of risk capital organization called Maine Technology Institute. They've also contributed some funding as well as the Maine Space Grant Consortium. And what's the reaction been like generally from the public in Maine? 
it's interesting because, you know, initially out of the gates, it's, it wasn't very public facing. So most of the reaction we've gotten by and large has been extremely positive. It's been um, very supportive. People are like, their minds are blown. They're so, you know, they're very excited about it. But as you say, you know, anything to do with space has to be implemented in a safe, very safe uh, and sustainable way. And because of Maine's ethos, kind of, we want the space court to represent that, the space complex to represent that. So sustainability is actually a really important piece of the way that we will go forward and develop and ultimately operate under that value. You know, when we started, when we went through the um, the bill signing process to initiate and establish the corporation, we started to get some interest from some dissenting dissenters. So we began to see, I think one of the things that was really interesting to me, something that I I completely would never have guessed, is that there are a lot lot of anti-nuclear protesters um, that came out of sort of the woodwork to um, push back on the legislation. And I think it sort of highlighted this fact that, you know, space has really evolved since the 1960s and 70s, sort of where, you know, most of these people kind of got their grounding and and developed their philosophy around the anti-nuke stance. And while, you know, there's certainly potential for it to be part of the future of space, it's not as much a military government operation as it once was. Obviously now today, it's very much commercially focused. Yes, the government is still a big piece of it, but you know, there's concerns about the government military complex taking over when really the, the entirety of our sort of focus right now is on the commercial sector. So there's a lot of misinformation and misinterpretation, some conspiracy around who ultimately will own this. But um, we have just started sort of reaching out and engaging with the environmental groups, which is another big piece of that. Obviously, as you know, Doing a environmental assessment is a big piece. And, and one of the first pieces of establishing a spaceport is a quite lengthy and pretty in-depth process. So we're not at that stage yet. We're still getting the plans and the location locked down. So we, we haven't crossed that bridge yet, but we're about to start engaging with the communities in Northern Maine that could potentially be homes or sites for the spaceport. What are you looking at for the ROI on a space complex up there in the state? You know, what's the benefit to those that are going to be around as residents? So, yeah, that's, that's a, that's, I mean, that's the key question. That's, I think, what we set out to answer, really. And it, we studied extensively the other spaceports across the U.S. and looked at their financial models and sort of what they brought to the area. And, you know, recently I just read something from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, they estimated that the impact, the economic impact was around a billion dollars a year. So the impact can be pretty substantial. Not all of it is going to be focused in one area. The spaceport, as we've designed it, is geographically distributed throughout the state. So a spaceport might be in the northern part. Um, we would have innovation sort of spread throughout the state, but with focus points on the old Loring Air Force Base, which is now Loring Development, and then the uh, Brunswick Um, naval base, which is Brunswick Landing now. So, you know, it will be geographically distributed, but there certainly will be impacts in the area for the operations of the spaceport, but also, as you know, tourism is a big piece of that. So give me your pitch, Emily. Why would a company want to think about Maine as a location for launch or innovation hubs? I think it offers a number of benefits. I think what Maine really offers is a willingness to work with the companies and get them what they need. It may not all be in the form of um, check writing, but it's a really cooperative, collaborative state. It's got a great quality of life. And I think the ability to operate in an area that's not highly dense, but also has those strategic infrastructure pieces right there. And the New England region actually has a pretty well-built out aerospace and defense industry. So it's not just Maine that we're looking at. We're looking at the entire region. And I think that, you know, there's just a tremendous opportunity here. And launch is, is one of the linchpins, but, you know, data analytics, we just, we now have, we're recently gifted um, $200 million to establish a outpost of the Northeastern University to focus on data analytics, AI, and machine learning, which is located in Portland. So that's a big piece. 
we've got a pretty great and a well-established materials industry, advanced materials industry in Maine, which obviously goes hand in hand with the space industry and other adjacencies. Actually, Maine is interesting. When we're doing the research, we found that per capita wise, we have more people in the aerospace industry than many other states, you know, percentage wise, um, based on our population. So there are a lot of capabilities, I think, that are in Maine that may not be focused necessarily directly on space right now, but are adjacencies and we can build off of that. We also are, are really thinking through and very intentional about our workforce development strategy about, around space. And I think as space continues to grow and the demand for qualified professionals, both trade and, you know, the aerospace engineers and mechanical engineers, um, I think that's like a big piece of the puzzle that we're hoping to offer. Good luck to Emily and Maine as they make big moves in the launch arena. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. The NCAA equivalent of academia concluded on Saturday. I spent the week at the 2023 Spaceport America Cup, watching the brightest minds in engineering from around the world compete at the world's largest student rocket competition. Over 90 rocket launches were held between Wednesday and Saturday at the launch facility in New Mexico. Over 1,500 people gathered for the closing ceremony, eagerly awaiting the announcement of who was taking home the Genesis Trophy for this year's competition. Let me have my welcome to everybody here, along with everyone following the live stream. I'm, I'm really proud. They had multiple category awards to give out. Best 30,000-foot solid rocket, 30,000-foot hybrid, 10,000-foot categories for solid and hybrid engines, student research and design components, best payload, team spirit, and so much more. The Pan American Center basketball arena was electric in anticipation, as each level was announced with runners-up. And the winner of the 10K commercial off-the-shelf category is Team 7 from Brigham Young University. And it was Brigham Young University that was crowned as the overall winners of the 2023 Spaceport America Cup. So congratulations to BYU Rocketry and others that took home trophies on Saturday. We attempted to speak to the team after the announcement, but the excitement was just too loud. We will be speaking to them later this week and we'll bring you their reaction. And we will, of course, share all the full rankings once they're published. And if you're wondering about how you can get involved in next year's Spaceport America Cup, you can visit soundingrocket.org and reach out to the Experimental Sounding Rocket Association that runs the competition. That's it for T-Miners for June 26th, 2023. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in our show notes. Your feedback ensures we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead of the rapidly changing space industry. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. 
N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was mixed by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Carr. Our chief intelligence officer is Eric Tillman. And I'm Alice Carruth. Thanks for listening. T-minus.